volume is very low. Let's turn that up so I can actually hear you. Excellent. All righty. Let's go ahead and get started. Today is Tuesday, May 4th, 2021. We are rapidly approaching the end of this class. We have, in fact, uh, this week's lectures, and that is it. So today and Thursday, and we are done uh, covering everything that you need to know for 430 to both be successful in this class and to help you moving forward into 431. Uh, we are on to our last major topic, and that is the autonomic nervous system. Uh, we are going to uh, talk some more about that today and then finish that up on Thursday. And then if, any, if there's any time remaining, uh, we will talk a little bit about the sensory stuff. I know you're all tired. I know you're all exhausted, but I promise you this stuff we're talking about today and Thursday uh, that we started last time uh, on the autonomic nervous system is the stuff that probably is going to be the most important as you move forward into 431. As we talk about 431, understanding how the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system influence the other organ systems we're going to talk about is going to be very important because whether it's respiration or urinary or reproductive, our autonomic nervous system controls it all. So we will be very, very busy with that. You have one more assignment due. That's a fun one. Uh, the reflex lab, do what you can of those procedures. Uh, like I said, anything that you can't, then guess what you think what the answer would be. Either do it as a thought experiment or look it up. But again, I don't want uh, just blank answers or someone just writing, I couldn't do it because I didn't have a tuning fork. All right? I know you don't probably have a tuning fork, but uh, figure it out. Uh, don't have to do the activity, but think what you might occur, what might occur. And if not, don't look on the almighty Google and figure it out. And then it's all tests. Tuesday the 11th, we have our lab and lecture exam. You know what to expect from that. You've already done four of them. The format's going to be the same. Easy breezy. Uh, the 13th that week, we do not have class. That is finals week. So uh, we do not meet that week. I will have my normal office hours. I may have some additional office hours if you have any questions. And I'm always available by email. But you're not responsible for coming back till the following Tuesday, the 18th, where you have your cumulative final exam. Again, 100 multiple choice questions, have about 100 minutes to complete it. Uh, it should be very simple and very straightforward. All right, questions on any of that? All righty, I love my blank stares and, and dense silence. Tells me that we are enthusiastic for being here. Excellent, that's what I like. All right. We left off last class and we had talked about the uh, anatomical and functional differences between the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. Uh, the difference in the pathways, the difference in the neurotransmitters and all of the things associated with that. But as we left off talking about, and as you can see from this illustration that our book has given us, not only are there differences between the autonomic and the somatic motor, but there's difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, the two branches of our, uh, does someone have a question or someone just got their microphone on? All right, excellent. So let's talk about those two divisions, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And even though we said it numerous times, someone remind me of the cutesy little mnemonics that we have to help us to remember these two by. What is the cutesy little rhyming mnemonic for the sympathetic? Is it the fight or flight? Exactly. And that is actually a pretty good uh, cutesy definition to remind us of what it does. Our sympathetic nervous system is what helps us to deal with stressful situations, right? Stressful situations are typically bears with axes. So if you've got that bear with an ax that walks into the door, you have two choices fight that bear with an ax or outrun somebody in the classroom, right? And so it is that uh, a good, good mnemonic to help us to remember that. What was the cutesy mnemonic for the parasympathetic? Is that the rest and digest? Yeah, rest and digest. This one isn't quite as accurate uh, in what its functionality. And we'll see if we can come up with some different ones that might be a little bit more accurate uh, for those. Of course, we're not gonna get away with just cutesy mnemonics, we will talk more about their function uh, in more depth in just a minute. But one of the other important things to remember about these are these are antagonistic inputs. 
And so most of the effectors, and let's go ahead and draw uh, one of the more obvious effectors. And again, it may take me a little bit of time to do this as anatomically accurately as possible. But of course, what organ of your body is that right there? The heart. The heart, there you go, excellent. The heart, like most of the organs in the body, receive dual innervation, meaning that they get both sympathetic input and they get parasympathetic input into it. Why? Is it because you're supposed to be able to um, excite and then calm down? Exactly, right? Antagonistic inputs mean that they have the opposite effects. So our sympathetic input to the heart is what? When we're in that stressful fight or flight situation, what do we want to do to our heart rate? It would, it would increase heart rate? Yeah. So what would we call something that increased the activity of? Excitatory. Excitatory. Excellent. Whereas the parasympathetic, what type of effect does it have on the heart? Inhibitory. There you go. Excellent, inhibitory, perfect, All right? With this dual innervation, with these opposing inputs, right? We have what we call an autonomic tone where most organs receive constant input from both the uh, sympathetic and the parasympathetic uh, inputs, I mean, uh, branches, let's say it that way. Now, while they're both receiving constant input, is that input always going to be of the same amount? No, so it varies in the size of the input. When we are, that bear with an ax walks in the room, we're gonna get more sympathetic input, meaning more excitatory input, and the heart rate will go up. When we're in that yoga class and we're sitting there, you know, and we're trying to center ourselves, uh, we are gonna get more uh, parasympathetic input, which is going to decrease the heart rate as a result of it. The advantage of this is we get very precise control. I like to always relate these to things that we understand and our house is something we easily understand. Notice in our houses, you want to control the temperature of your house. You want to set a precise temperature to your house. You want to maintain control. And the way you do that is by having both a heater and an air conditioner. All right. If you just had a heater, that would be fine in the winter because the winter would bring the temperature down and our heater would bring it back up and the winter would bring it back down and the heater would bring it back up. But what about on today like today when it's going to reach 90 degrees possibly? Is having just a heater going to help you to control the temperature of your house? No. No. So by having precise inputs, uh, pardon me, by having antagonistic inputs, we can keep precise control of the organs. And notice one more thing, as I mentioned here, our sympathetic was excitatory here, our parasympathetic was inhibitory, but it doesn't mean that sympathetic is always excitatory and parasympathetic is always inhibitory. What if instead, right? We had an organ like, of course, you can tell that that is the stomach what is the sympathetic input to the stomach? Inhibitory or, or excitatory? Inhibitory? Yeah. It is gonna be inhibitory. And with a name like rest and digest, what do you think the parasympathetic input into the stomach would be? Excitatory. So again, 
It's not that one is always excitatory and one is always inhibitory, is that they are always opposite of each other. They are always antagonistic. All right. Do you understand? Do we understand that and why that is important? Excellent. Complete silence means yes, we understand that entirely. That's good to hear. I have a quick question. Yes. So can you explain the stomach again? So it the sympathetic is inhibitory because like you said, it it's does it's doing the opposite. Am I understanding correctly? Well, they have opposite effects. And again, think of it this way. Um, we have limited resources in our body. For instance, one of those limited resources is our blood. We don't necessarily have enough blood in our body to have maximal diffusion of blood to all parts of our body at all times. So when that bear with an ax walks into the room, do we wanna necessarily be sending a large amount of blood to my stomach so that I can digest that cheeseburger that I had for breakfast? No. No, instead, I want to be sending that blood uh, to my muscles, to my heart, to my lungs to get oxygen, places like that, doing things along those lines. So in those cases, my digestive activity isn't as important as dealing with whatever this stressful situation that is dealing with me right now. So we are going to decrease blood flow, decrease activation of our stomach. But, you know, if we are resting and digesting, right, if we've just had that big, huge Thanksgiving dinner and we're sitting down to watch TV, then our parasympathetic is going to increase blood flow, increase activation of the stomach to take care of that big, huge meal we just ate. Okay, Does that make that makes, sense? Yeah, it makes more sense. Thank you. Excellent. Perfect. Okay, so basically sympathetic is when you decrease blood flow, decrease activation, and then parasympathetic is basically the opposite. It just increases and everything. For the stomach, yes. And again, that's the kind of point I was trying to make here between the heart and the stomach. Obviously, different effectors, they're going to have different effects. Okay. Remember, it was one of the ways that our autonomic is different from our somatic motor. Remember, all somatic motor all go to skeletal muscle. So in those case, the effect of all somatic motor is always excitatory, right? We wanna make that skeletal muscle contract. Remember, noticed here with our autonomic nervous system, it is going to smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. Some of these we're gonna to wanna to activate and some of these we are going to want to uh, decrease the activation of. It totally depends on the situation. It totally depends on the organs, right? Let's talk about two different glands, sympathetic and parasympathetic. So our sweat glands. What do you think our sweat glands are excited by? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Sympathetic. Sympathetic. But what about our salivary glands? Parasympathetic. Parasympathetic, right? When you have to stand up in front of that class and give that big speech, right? You might get sweaty, your palms get sweaty, right? As you're nervous, but your mouth is dry as a bone. So different organs are going to be affected different ways by the autonomic nervous system. Whereas that somatic motor was much more straightforward. All right. It makes sense. Thank you. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. And especially when we talk about the physiology of this, I think the physiology of this is something that we all really know and understand. So let's do one quick thing first, and then we'll talk about the physiology because the physiology is easier. If we understand this dual innervation, if we understand why it's important, if we understand this antagonism, then what we have to do is we have to come back to this pesky word most because most means not all. So what that means is there are going to be some organs that only get input from one branch of the nervous system. And the good news is most of these are obvious, but there is gonna be one that's gonna seem a little tricky and we'll see if we can make sense of it. All right, so they're always antagonistic. We always have that autonomic tone. 
And our goal is to maintain homeostasis, whether it's the temperature in the body, whether it's the pH of our blood, whether it's our heart rate, whatever it is, we need to maintain that homeostasis. Now, let's talk about those exceptions, the ones that do not have dual innervation. The ones that do not have dual innervation are innervated only by the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system doesn't go to them. And like I said, most of these are pretty obvious. The adrenal gland. What does the adrenal gland do? Gives adrenaline to the body when needed. Yeah. And when do we need adrenaline? During a fight or flight situation. Exactly. So that makes sense. We're going to release adrenaline when stressed. So that makes sense that it would just get input from the sympathetic nervous system because there's no reason for our parasympathetic nervous system to, uh, to tell to do anything because we just release this when we're stressed. So when there's a sympathetic input, we release adrenaline. Our skin is another great example. Our sweat glands, our rector pili muscles, all of these things basically associated with the skin are also uh, only innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. Again, as we talked about, when you're stressed, you can get all sweaty. When you exercise, you get all sweaty, right? Your rectal pili muscles stand up on end when you're scared, when you're cold. Right? And we need to contract the muscles and bring the activity up. So this makes sense, as do most of the blood vessels of the body. So again, as we've talked about, you have to stand up and give that speech and your complexion gets really pale. Why does your complexion get really pale? Because the blood vessels of your skin contract. Remember, we talked about how the skin was a blood reservoir uh, where there's a lot of blood just slowly chugging along in there. But when we're in that stressful situation, those blood vessels constrict, move the blood away from the skin so we can send it to those important areas. So we are going to both constrict blood vessels to the non-essential areas. And we are gonna dilate blood vessels To the essential areas. And again, I mean essential and non-essential as in for dealing with the stress. Obviously being able to break down a cheeseburger so that I can get the nutrients into my body is something that is vitally important, but not when a bear with an ax walks in the room. But once again, we have this pesky word most. There are some exceptions. And the primary exceptions are the blood vessels uh, that, um, let's say it this way, oops, why did that not work? There it is. Blood vessels. Blood vessels that release blood when aroused. What areas become engorged when blood when we are aroused? This is an anatomy and physiology class. You are allowed to say penis. Any other areas besides the penis? The vagina. Okay, specifically the labia of the vagina and what else of the, of the female? Is it the clitoris? Clitoris, there you go, exactly. So the clitoris of the female, the labia majora of the female and the penis of the male, those three structures, uh, the blood vessels that control them, that release blood when aroused, these are actually controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, you may not have thought of it in these terms, but I know you're aware of it. 
because now that we're all getting our vaccinations and they're starting to open things up again, you get that opportunity to take that boy out on that very special third date. And when I take that young lad on onto his third date, he knows I'm taking him to a very nice restaurant. I'm going to drop a whole lot of money on him and I'm going to expect something in return. Right now, he might be a little nervous about that. And if you're too nervous, too stressed, have too much of a sympathetic uh, activation, then what can happen to that poor lad? Failure to perform. Yeah, he may have a little bit of a challenge rising to the occasion, right? Because we need to have that parasympathetic input for that. So of course, again, knowing this like I do, what do you do? You ply him with alcohol right? Not enough so that you have that whiskey problem, but you're just enough to take the edge off so he's a little less stressed, and then you can get what you need from him, right? A good mnemonic to remember when we get to the reproductive system in 431 is point and shoot. Point, the arousal, the erection in both males and females is a parasympathetic reflex. Orgasm, the shoot, in both males and females is a sympathetic reflex. So these blood vessels associated with arousal, associated with reproduction, right, are uh, the ones that are not controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. And again, if you think about it, that makes some semblance of sense. Because if a bear with an ax walks in the room, my first instinct shouldn't be to propagate the species, right? That's not a good time to try to reproduce. So again, that makes a little bit of sense, hopefully. Here's the one that's a little odd. All of those I think make good semblance of sense, but here's the one that seems odd. Not all bears, there was, where was the bear? They just killed some man-eating bear and found remains inside of them. Where did that take place? It's gotta be someplace like Minnesota or something like that. I just saw that on the news. I don't know where it happened, but there was a man-eating bear that was just put down uh, just within the past week. Yeah, see, there you go. See, bears are terrifying. And then to be able to have an ax as well, again, look, I, I'm not the one who made this up. You know, from a biological standpoint, there is truly nothing more scary in the universe than a bear with an ax. Studies have shown this, so you can't argue with science. All right, now then, as I mentioned, the one of these things that doesn't make sense is the kidneys. Because when we think of using energy, fight or flight, when, or when we think of housekeeping type energies like rest and digest, rest and digest, what does kidney function sound more like? Does it sound more like a rest and digest housekeeping type of function? Or does it sound more like a stressful uh, fight or flight type of function? It seems more like a rest and digest. Yeah, it seems like much more of a housekeeping type of process. But here's the deal. Remember, at rest, and I think we said this before in this class, about 25% of your blood is, being, is going to the, uh, the kidneys. processing. So while you're sitting here at rest, 25% of your blood is going to the kidneys to be processed. All right. And how important is that filtering of the blood by the kidneys? Very. Yeah. If someone were to come and rip two of your kidneys out of your body, right? How long would you survive without that? Not very, not very long. Isn't it just like hours, a matter of hours? It'd be a little longer than hours. It would be a couple days, right? We could prolong that with dialysis, but dialysis is not a long-term solution. It's a short-term stopgap until we can get another kidney into your body. And if we've learned anything, life is somewhat lazy, right? If I ripped two of those kidneys out of your body, your prognosis wouldn't be very good. But what if I just ripped one of those kidneys out of your body? How long could you survive then for? You can live with one kidney. Yeah, forever, exactly, 
right? You can sell it on eBay, give it away in a raffle, whatever you want. You could have one kidney. And exactly, people donate their kidneys and still be fully functional. One kidney is actually capable of doing all of the filtering necessary. And it is a vital process of the body. So we have this huge redundancy, vitally important process at rest. But at rest, 25% of the blood is going there. So we have a massive blood supply. And that gives us a massive blood pressure. And that blood pressure is important because the blood pressure does the work. That blood pressure is important for filtering the blood and allowing us to, uh, to process it and stay healthy. But here's the problem. When you become active, as we talked about, you get up and you run down to the store. Well, then there you go. Uh, you go down to the store. Uh, you run downstairs to get your coffee. You decide uh, that my lectures are too boring, so you jump on the exercise bike. When you are active, as a result of this, you have much less blood going to the kidneys. That means that the blood pressure drops. And if the blood pressure drops, the kidneys become less effective. So every time we stand up and walk around, our kidneys become less effective. Could that potentially be a problem? Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And so when active, it is actually our sympathetic nervous system that helps to maintain uh, the blood pressure in the kidneys so they can function with less blood. Turns out while you're sitting here at rest with 25% of your blood going to your kidneys, you don't really need your parasympathetic nervous system to say, hey, kidneys, do your job. They're able to do the job just fine. It's when we're moving around and we're active, when there's less blood going to the kidneys that the kidneys need the help. And that's what our sympathetic nervous system does. It helps the kidneys to maintain that blood pressure so they can maintain their function. All right, so while the kidneys don't seem like an obvious example of an organ that only gets sympathetic input, it is vitally important. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So with that in our pocket, now that we understand kind of what they're controlling and doing, let's talk about, oh yes, uh, Julia, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question. Yeah. So like if people are working long, long shifts, like 20 hours or 18 hours, does that mean their kidneys are not, you know, able to do a good enough job filtering? So, okay, just working a long day in and of itself probably is not enough, but you do have the right idea, right? So we're talking about being active, like walking to the store or doing things like that. But what happens if you are extremely active or extremely stressed? Yeah, and, and then some people don't sleep the eight hours they should, so their kid will never get. You are right. Our sympathetic nervous system can compensate for some of it, Right, so you're right. When you're doing exercise like a bodybuilder, when you're sprinting during that race, uh, when you're running from that bear with an ax, with that type of extreme activity or with extreme stress, you are correct. The sympathetic can only do so much. So yes, there is going to be a decrease in kidney function. How long does that exercise, that bodybuilder exercising last? How long does that sprint last? How long is a fight with a bear and an ax gonna last? These things typically don't last for a very long period of time. So typically when you're extremely active, it's for a short period of time. And so in the long term of things, it's not that big of a deal. Where you run into problems is here. 
if you indeed have an incredibly stressful job or are dealing with chronic stress from family, from work, from a &P classes, whatever it is that you're dealing with, those things can last for a very prolonged period of time. And chronic stress can have long-term impacts on your kidney function, yes. Yeah, so again, uh, th there can be some, some extreme examples of that, but when it's doing for a prolonged period of time, so that can decrease kidney function. Extreme stress, it doesn't even have to be physical stress. Emotional stress can also affect chronic, if it's chronic, can affect kidney function as well. So yes. All right. Which is again, how do you deal with stress? Drink alcohol. All the stress goes away, your kidneys will be fine. Of course, your liver will be shot, but you know, you got to pick and choose. All right. Excellent. All righty. So I want to now talk about the physiological effects of the autonomic nervous system, the things that it does to us. Again, I guarantee there are going to be questions on both the physiological and anatomical functions of the sympathetic and parasympathetic or comparisons of them. Make sure you pick the right one. Physiological are the functional effects it has on its, our body. And as we talked about, this is that fight or flight we've talked about, where we're using energy. We are mobilizing energy to deal with stress. And I already gave you one because I just flipped the slide, but Tell me physiologically some of the changes that occur in your body when you are stressed, when you are scared. Your heart rate increases. Excellent. And not only does heart rate increase, but what else increases? Don't you also increase um, like glycogen storage? Yeah, we'll get to that, but let's finish talking about the, the heart at first. The heart beats faster, but what else does it do? Increased blood, blood pressure? Well, you true, that is correct. It also, it uh, so the heart rate increasing indirectly uh, increases blood pressure. Your breathing rate increases? Uh, yeah, you guys are all hitting it, but I want to go back to the heart rate real fast. So yes, your heart beats faster, but notice you also feel it in your chest. So not only does the heart rate increase, but the strength of the contraction increases as well. Excellent. A uh, respiration rate, I heard that one. Increases, right? So we breathe faster, get more oxygen into our blood, pump that blood along to our body. Now, someone said something about glucose. Do we want to store glucose when that bear with an ax wants, walks into the room? No. 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 What do we want to do? Oh, never mind. We want to release it for energy. Yeah, we want to mobilize glucose. Get it ready to use. Because again, the things that stress us, like bears with axes that used to roam the countryside, right? Uh, we need to deal with them physically. Stress is a response to things that are threatening our lives. And so we mobilize our glucose. What this means is we release... Uh, glucose from the liver. Uh, we release uh, uh, fatty acids. Oops. Uh, from our adipose. Right. We release those reserves into our blood, increasing blood glucose levels, so we can deal with that stress. Right. Again. This is an evolutionary biological process that is vital for our survival. The problem is life and society has changed. Very rarely now will you find a bear with an ax roaming the countryside. And we're no longer living in trees or at the bases of trees surrounded by the environment where we have to fear for our life. Now the things that stress us are that 10 page paper that's due on Friday 
or that lab and a lecture exam that is going to do next week or things along those lines. And if you have a 10 page paper due tomorrow, how do you deal with that? Usually clean the whole house. Okay. Yes, you may try to get rid of some of that excess energy crying, or when you finally get around to doing it, you sit at a computer and do a whole lot of this. While you sit at the computer and type at that computer, are you using all of those resources that you've mobilized into your body? No. No. So now you're stressed, you mobilize those resources, you don't use those resources, and what happens? You choke. Well, you've got all this glucose in your blood. There you go. If you're not using those resources, it gets stored as fat, right? I was glorious before I had kids, right? I had my eight pack, I had hair, right? All those kind of things. Now I have kids, I have stress, right? And now I look like this, right? Absolutely. The things that stress us now are not the things that stressed us before. And so as a result of that, these biological effects, right, that normally help us deal with the stress aren't the kind of things that help us this way as well. Excellent. We also talked about uh, blood vessel activity. As we talked about uh, most blood vessels, uh, to non-essential areas, uh, dilate, uh, pardon me, constrict. So less blood goes to those areas. And again, that also increases our blood pressure. But as we also talked about, we are gonna dilate blood vessels to what areas? Where are some of the areas where you think we would dilate blood vessels to send more blood to those areas? Heart, excellent. Where else? Mind regions, the brain. The brain's a good guess. So, do you really think better when you're stressed? No. No. I I know many many students. That big. My one. Of my oldest daughter is one of them who thinks that they work best working at the last minute, because that stress of it being due in four hours helps them to be successful. There is nothing further from the truth. Right. Typically, again, stress is that fight or flight dealing with that life or death situation. If a bear with an axe walks in the room, you don't have to do calculus. The decisions you have to make are very basic. And so as a result of that, the nervous system does not get an increased blood flow when you're stressed. Right. Because the decisions you're going to make are much more basic, life saving, basic uh, uh, decisions. So, no, the, heart, the brain isn't one of them. Heart is one of them. Lungs, I think someone mentioned that. We need to get that more air. We were talking about our skeletal muscle. And then also, as we just talked about, our liver and our adipose so that we can get that energy that has been uh, to, to be mobilized. What else happens when we're stressed? You sweat. Excellent. So we saw activation headaches of sweat glands. Uh, headaches can occur. Again, that can be due to the decrease in blood flow to the skin. Uh, some migraines are caused by the superficial blood vessels going to the scalp. So that can indeed cause some types of migraines and things like that that can occur that way. What is fiddling? Like you start to fiddle with your fingers or bite your nails. Okay. I, so I think that type of nervous activity is where you're more using the energy because we have that uh, blood going to the skeletal muscle. So you get that antsiness, you get that alertness as a result of that. Uh, the adrenal gland, absolutely activation of the sweat glands, uh, adrenal gland. Uh, Would adrenal people... gland count as for like your hair standing on edge type thing? Sure. Activation of the sweat glands, erector pili muscles. Adrenal gland uh, releases epinephrine. So 
Uh, cold, again, when we're stressed, you get a decrease in blood flow to the skin. So the blood vessels of the skin constrict, pulling it away from that. But at the same time, uh, we, you also increase activation of our sweat glands. So uh, again, the, the part of whether you're getting hot or cold may be your own personal interpretation of it. If you're sweating, you usually sweat because you're feeling hot. Uh, so they can perceive it that way. But obviously, as that evaporates or as your hands get cold as a result of that, then you could be feeling cold as a result of it as well. So it may also be an interpretation of it, All right? Uh, I accidentally flipped one, but you guys haven't gotten that yet. Pupils. Dilate. Why? Why do your pupils dilate when you're stressed? So when you run out the door from the bear with an X, you can see in the dark. True, or yes, you got the right idea to let more light in. You wanna be able to let more light in because you want to be able to better preserve it, perceive your environment. Bears with axes are, axes are very, very tricky. They can easily blend in. So when you hear that, you know, that tree limb branch crack and you eyes dilate so you can look around and take in the light and better assess your environment. Excellent. I think we got most of it. Let's look at the list. I think I've got this. Let's look at the list that I have on the board. Pupils dilate, heart rate, force of contraction, blood pressure all increase, airways dilate. I think we said that. Uh, blood, blood vessels to non-essential organs constrict, blood vessels to the heart, lungs, skeletal muscle, liver, adipose dilate, release that glucose, getting that energy ready. And I guess we didn't say that as well, but there's the decrease in digestive function. Right, decrease in, and this is both uh, muscle activity and also glandular activity. So, as we talked about, your salivary gland uh, decreases in activity, so your mouth gets dry as a result of it. This is also why you're not supposed to swim for a full half an hour after you've eaten. If you have a big meal and then you decide to immediately go out and start swimming, swimming is a very vigorous activity. Right. Again, if you're just lack, you know, you know, laying in the pool, that's not a big deal. But if you're trying to swim a mile, you know, out to the middle of a lake, then that decreased blood flow, decreased glandular activity, decreased muscular activity of the digestive system can cause you to not be able to fully completely digest that meal. And as you have those incomplete digested materials in your stomach, in your small intestine, that can cause intestinal cramping which again, if you're a half mile out in the middle of a lake can cause problems. Excellent. Most of us have been stressed at one period of time in our life or another. So again, I don't think these things are too uh, uncommon. I think this is all stuff that we kind of all had a general understanding and idea of because we've all been stressed. So questions on this. Now, here's the other nice thing. So while uh, we know sympathetic and parasympathetic are antagonistic, then basically if we know everything that the sympathetic does, we kind of know everything that the, the that parasympathetic does. If sympathetic dilates the eyes, parasympathetic constricts the pupils. If sympathetic increases heart rate, parasympathetic decreases heart rate. So these are antagonistic of each other. And so that makes it easy, but we do want to organize it. And I've promised you some better mnemonics than rest and digest. So let's talk about those. As I mentioned, our parasympathetic is where we store energy. These are what I like to think of personally as our kind of housekeeping type of activities. Uh, so again, maintaining uh, homeostasis, storing energy. One good mnemonic for the parasympathetic is SLUD. SLUD is a description of all of the major physiological processes that our parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for. What's salivation? Like saliva drool. Yeah, producing saliva. Lacrimation. Uh, production from your eyelids, from your lacrimal gland. Yeah, lacrimal making gland. tears, 
crying, absolutely crying. Uh, urination, digestion, defecation, all of those I think are obvious. Also with a parasympathetic nervous system, there are three big decreases. Our parasympathetic nervous system decreases the heart rate, decreases the airway, and it decreases the size of our pupils. I don't remember if I have told this story before in this class, but I have a student who took me at AR, gosh, must've been like 10 years ago now, took me for both 430 and 431. She got into the nursing program at AR, completed that nursing program and is now out having fun being a nurse. And in the year that she was in my class, her and her boyfriend, uh, now fiance, but boyfriend at the time, had a cabin up in Tahoe. And not once, not twice, but three times while, he was, while she was in my class, they had to call EMTs to their cabin up in Tahoe because what he liked to do was hike around the mountains and eat wild mushrooms. And not once, not twice, but three times he got a hold of some bad mushrooms and those mushrooms, those poisonous mushrooms, basically what they do is they activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So what ends up happening is he started you know, tears start being produced in his eyes. He started overproducing saliva. Then his airways constricted, his heart rate decreased, his pupils came down to pinholes. As far as I know, his eyes didn't bleed as a result of it, but he had all of these other effects. Yeah, he lived all three times. Uh, and again, that was just in the time they were in my class. I don't know if it's something he still continues to do. She's marrying him, so hopefully he's finally learned his lesson. But, um, but yeah, again, they must be incredibly tasty mushrooms if he continues to do this. But, <laughs> but again, you can see that by activating this, that's got to not be a fun thing to be, you know, be drooling at the mouth, tears coming out of your eyes, your airways constrict, your heart rate decreases, your pupils constrict. Right, so all of those effects that he had as a result of that. I remember we also talked about our parasympathetic nervous system uh, leads to that arousal, the erection of the penis and clitoris. And your book, although I'm not sure that tape, that page number is correct. Uh, so let's get rid of that. Um, the book has a nice table that does a good job of uh, describing this. So again, make sure you look at that stuff if you haven't already. Because again, I think when we talk about the physiology, I think the physiology is pretty simple and straightforward. I think that's stuff that we're all kind of familiar with. And so it is stuff that uh, we kind of know and expect and understand. So I think that makes it a little bit easier. All right, questions on that. All righty, excellent. That is our physiology. That is the easy part. That is the fun part. Now, what we need to talk about are the anatomical differences. How are we on time? We're doing good, excellent. Let's talk about the anatomical differences between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Notice here, we have a general autonomic pathway we know it is comprised of two neurons, the one I've pointed at here with a blue arrow and the one I've pointed at here with a red arrow. How do we identify this blue neuron, the one whose cell body is located in the central nervous system and forms its synapse in the uh, autonomic ganglion? How do we identify this first neuron in the pathway? Multipolar. Well, it is multipolar, but we identify it as preganglionic. It is a preganglionic neuron, which conveniently enough, the name of was right here. We also, as we mentioned, have our second neuron whose cell body is located in that autonomic ganglion that terminates and synapses on the effector. 
and whose neuron is unmyelinated, whereas the first one was myelinated. And how do we identify this second neuron in the pathway? Give you a hint. Once again, it's green. There you go. It's a postganglionic neuron. These are the easy questions, folks. The questions are literally on the screen. So excellent. So we have this two neuron pathway, and that is true for both sympathetic and parasympathetic. So that's going to be true for both. We've talked about that. But there are going to be some differences. Mostly, uh, their locations of the cell bodies, the locations of the ganglia, where the ganglia are located. Let's not use red for that. Where the ganglion are located, where in the spinal cord the cell bodies are located, right? And what structures are formed by these axons and the overall branching of these systems as well. One of the big differences that we've kind of talked about is our sympathetic uh, response is a big global response. When that bear with the ax walks in the room, do your eyes dilate and five minutes after that, your heart beats faster and six minutes after that, your stomach shuts down and 10 minutes after that, your hairs stand up on end and five minutes after that, your airways dilate. Is that how that works when you're stressed? No. No, no, it all happens at once. It's one big coordinated global response. Is the same thing true for your parasympathetic? No, it takes a little bit for it to like all settle down. Well, it's not just even that either. I don't mean necessarily coming down from being stressed. I mean, like, for instance, like we talked about that big third dates going on this weekend. You take that young lad to Ruth Christ you buy them a really nice expensive uh, ribeye that has that nice herb butter on it. And when they bring that to the table and you get the smell of it and you get to look at it and you start salivating, do you cry at the same time? Does seeing that steak make you defecate? No. No, you get a local response here. Now, you may cry and defecate when you get the bill, right? But you can salivate without crying, right? You get local effects uh, with our parasympathetic nervous system. So when we look at the neural pathways, our sympathetic nervous system is going to have a, a lot of, hold on, let's make that that again. When it comes to the branching, our sympathetic is going to form lots of connections. There's going to be lots of branching. Make this smaller so it fits in the space. Lots of connections and lots of branching, whereas our parasympathetic is going to make very few connections. Very little branching so that it gets that more local type of an effect. So that is gonna be another big difference we're gonna see in these pathways. So their locations in the central nervous system, their locations in the, uh, where their ganglia are located and also uh, the branching associated with them. Let's take a look at this. Oh, and of course the neurotransmitter released as well. Excellent, all right, let's draw this. Are we on time still, we're still good? Yep, yeah, we are. So let's do the sympathetic first. When we look at the sympathetic pathway, make that a little smaller so it fits in. Actually, let's make that bigger. I like that bigger. When we look at the sympathetic pathway, we know it is going to start in the central nervous system. So 
We have a preganglionic neuron. We know a lot about this cell. We know that its cell body is in the central nervous system. And we know it is going to synapse on the ganglion. And I think I need this to be a little smaller. Let's see if that works. But one of the big differences about our sympathetic nervous system. Oops, I didn't mean to change the color of that. Oh well. Is that our sympathetic ganglia are very close to the uh, central nervous system. So they're very close to the central nervous system. So when we talk about this preganglionic neuron, let's go ahead and draw it. Multipolar neuron, cell bodies located in the lateral gray horn. Axon comes out the uh, ventral root forming the spinal nerve to come to this. And remind me again, is this myelinated or unmyelinated? Myelin. Myelinated. Myelinated, excellent. So let's put some myelin on here. So again, a preganglionic neuron, cell bodies located in the central nervous system, Myelinated, synapses on the ganglia. That's gonna be true for both of them. But what's gonna be different about it is because that sympathetic ganglion is so close, our preganglionic axon is short. And remember, as we also talked about it, it is elaborately branched. to make lots of synapses. So we have this short axon with many, many branches coming off of it, forming many, many synapses. Now, we'll just show one synapse here. Of course, we know, because we talked about it last time, this uh, preganglionic neuron releases acetylcholine and it is always excitatory. So we'll draw those little dots there and draw a little plus to remind us that it's excitatory. And of course, it communicates with our postganglionic neuron. Also multipolar. Obviously these things are not drawn to scale, but it's fine. With our postganglionic neuron, As we know, its cell body is in the ganglion. It synapses on the effectors. Its axon is unmyelinated. And again, those are things we know about all postganglionic neurons. But again, because our ganglia are so close to the cell body, when we talk, nope, there. Our postganglionic have long axons 
and are still going to elaborately branch to make lots of synapses. Here are those effectors. And again, it's the smooth muscle, um, uh, cardiac muscle, and our glands. And myelinated axon, many branches, many synapses. And here, most of our postganglionic neurons uh, release the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. Of course, what does most mean? Not all. Not, not, all. not all. You you ganglionic neurons, postganglionic neurons release the neurotransmitter. Oops, transmitter acetylcholine. And of course, as we know, some will be excitatory and some will be inhibitory. And that really depends on the effector. Like we talked about, if it's the heart, it's gonna be excitatory. So cardiac muscle would be excitatory. Smooth muscle of the stomach is going to be inhibitory. Smooth muscle of the erector pili muscle is going to be excitatory, right? So again, it's going to depend on the effector for that effect and that influence. And so just for consistency, some of these are going to release norepinephrine and some of these will release acetylcholine. Now, obviously one neuron doesn't release both, but you get the idea. All right, we still have that same general two neuron pathway but there are some differences. Differences in the branching, differences of the location of the ganglia, differences in the neurotransmitters that are released. So let's now do the same thing with our parasympathetic. Start with our spinal cord. We start with the same basic information. We still have a preganglionic. that in. Its cell body is in the central nervous system. It synapses on the ganglion. Its axon is myelinated. All of that part is the same. However, in our parasympathetic nervous system, the ganglia are basically, nope, 
right next to, or in some cases, actually inside of the organ. So they're very, very close to the effector for a very, very local effect. What that means, oops, is that our preganglionic neurons axon is much, oh, wrong color again, much, much longer. So our preganglionic. on is long. And remember, we want a local effect. So it's going to have few branches and few synapses for a small local effect. Now, just like we saw above, Preganglionic neuron always releases acetylcholine. And since I wrote it out before, I can do it here. Maybe I didn't write it out before, but that's all right. We know what acetylcholine is. And it is always excitatory. Excellent. So now let's talk about our postganglionic neuron. Still multipolar. Some uh, still unmyelinated axon. So again, our postganglionic neuron cell body in the ganglion. It uh, synapses on the effector. Its uh, axon is unmyelinated. So again, that's true for both of them, but where it is different, if it's right next to or even in the walls of the effector organ, that needs to be back so that this, the differences can be read, are uh, parasympathetic postganglionic as a short axon with few branches and few synapses. So again, we can have that local effect and all release acetylcholine. So when it comes to, again, our effectors, All of these release acetylcholine. And of course, our effectors are still smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. And again, some will be excitatory, some will be inhibitory. And again, it depends on the effector. So there you go. With this, we see both the similarities and the differences in these two pathways. Both require two neurons. 
both preganglionic neurons release acetylcholine. And for both of them, they're both excitatory. Oops, I forgot to myelinate this one. For both of them, their preganglionic neurons are myelinated. Their postganglionic neurons are unmyelinated. So their differences are the locations of the ganglia. And then that affects the lengths of their axons. But also the branching is different between them as well. And then the other big difference is what neurotransmitter is released to the effectors. For all of the parasympathetic, they're all acetylcholine. For most of the sympathetic, they are mostly norepinephrine, but a few of them also do acetylcholine, which again, shouldn't be terribly surprising. We said acetylcholine was the most common uh, parasympathetic neurotransmitter. So again, that shouldn't be too terribly surprising. All right, I've made a mess of the board. Let's take a look at the pretty pictures from your textbook that emphasize these facts as well. Notice here, we see the sympathetic pathway, shorter preganglionic neuron, longer postganglionic neuron. Notice elaborate branching of both the pre and the postganglionic neurons. Our preganglionic always releases acetylcholine. And remember, as we talked about, most of our, let's make that bigger. Most of our postganglionic sympathetic neurons release norepinephrine. We can compare this to our parasympathetic nervous system. Much longer preganglionic neuron because our autonomic ganglia are much further away. Much shorter postganglionic neuron. And notice both the pre and the postganglionic neurons have small branching, local effects, and both release acetylcholine. Yes, question. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the norepinephrine. Mm -hmm. um, I recall you you pointed out the difference between it and um, acetylcholine, but I don't remember what you said. I just said it was a different neurotransmitter. Uh, oh. what, the, the, what I said about norepinephrine is that both norepinephrine and epinephrine are our two stress hormones or what are also known as adrenaline and noradrenaline. Now, what I said was that for our purposes, while these are different neurotransmitters with different names, when we talked about all of those effects we just mentioned, increasing heart rate, increasing strength of, con uh, strength of contraction, dilating the airways, all of those things, basically for everything we're concerned, they're gonna have the exact same effect. So norepinephrine and epinephrine basically have the exact same effect and are pretty much, uh, for the most part, interchangeable. But no, acetylcholine and uh, norepinephrine are two completely different neurotransmitters that are going to have two completely different effects. Yes, question. Um, yes, you said that um, the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic um, have... Um, different um, amounts of synapses. Is the synaptic cleft smaller on the parasympathetic? Great question. No, not necessarily. They don't have to, it's not that they're smaller. If we look, if we go back to the previous picture, notice by having lots of branches, this could communicate with one, two, three, four, five different cells. This one could communicate with one, two, three, four, five, six different cells. Whereas notice here, one connection to one cell one connection to one cell. So it's just about how many synapses. Remember, we talked about how a single neuron could make as many as 10,000 different connections, right? We don't necessarily have to make that many, but it has the potential. And typically sympathetic make much more connections because we want all of it activated at once. We want that big global stress response. Whereas here, we want much more precision, much more smaller local effects. Got it, thank you. All right, and then notice 
your table's got that nice table. And then when we come back to this picture we were looking at before, notice they've kind of hinted at this for us here. With our sympathetic, notice our ganglion is closer to the central nervous system, where here our ganglion is closer to the effector. Notice with our parasympathetic, we're releasing acetylcholine, where most release norepinephrine. And remember, we also have this special branch to the sympathetic nervous system where we stimulate our adrenal gland, which releases adrenaline into the blood. And of course, if we want a big global stress response, once we put that adrenaline in the blood, where can adrenaline go once it gets in the blood? Everywhere. Everywhere, exactly. Giving us that huge, big, coordinated global response. All right, so even way back here when we looked at this, they were hinting at these differences, these anatomical differences between our sympathetic and our parasympathetic. Now, this is a good overview, but we need to do more than that. And to do more than that, we have to look at this scary fellow right here. I know this looks like some kind of super scary twisted octopus. But believe it or not, this is an incredibly useful, incredibly effective uh, map of our autonomic nervous system. And so what we are going to do is work together to interpret this map and the many more that we will see like it to truly understand the anatomical pathways of how our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system affect our body. We will start with the parasympathetic because the fact that it is local, the fact that it is brief effects makes it much easier to differentiate and describe. The pathways are much more straightforward. Even if we look at our octopus here, we can see the paths are much more straightforward, pretty much just one way to get to things. Whereas here we have this big, huge mess that we have to deal with in the sympathetic. So we'll start over here first, get our feet wet. And once we get comfortable with this, then we'll start to tackle the sympathetic today as well. All right, questions on any of that? All right, I wanna come at this information fresh. So let's go ahead and take our first break. It looks like it's uh, 117 now. Let's take a full uh, 15 minute break. So that means coming back at 132. And at 132, we will restart and I will start the recording at that time. Any questions before we take our break? All right, then get ready. Our mystical magical journey will continue. And get started. As promised, we will dip our feet into the shallow end by talking about the parasympathetic nervous system. Notice here, we have a nice pretty picture, a little bit more elaborate than the one we were just looking at and just showing the parasympathetic side of this. Now, again, remember one of the big differences, there were really three big differences that we were talking about with our uh, sympathetic versus our parasympathetic is where the cell bodies are located. And this is true for both the uh, for both the pre and post ganglionic neurons. So when we talk about the locations of the pre ganglionic neurons in the central nervous system. Uh, the parasympathetic nervous system anatomically is referred to as the craniosacral branch of the sympathetic nerve, I mean, of the autonomic nervous system. Because as you can see, our preganglionic neurons are either going to come off of the brain stem, hence the term cranial, or the lateral gray horn of the sacral spinal cord, hence the term sacral. So when we talk about it from an anatomical standpoint, we know preganglionic neurons are found in the central nervous system. And these are the two areas where we're gonna find them. 
either our brainstem associated with cranial nerves. Notice there are not one, not two, not three, but four cranial nerves that are involved in forming the pathways of our parasympathetic nervous system. So that's the cranial part, but also off of the sacral spinal cord as well, the lateral gray horn of the sacral spinal cord. So that's one of the big, big differences that we see there. <clears throat> now, the other thing, actually, let's go back to this and let's put all that back. The second big difference is the location Well, actually, no, this is still part of the second one. No, let's actually, let's, that's not entirely true. Hold on. So again, notice we said the big difference was where the uh, pre and post. So let's talk about the post ganglionic neurons. We know that their cell bodies are found in ganglia and specifically the parasympathetic ganglia. Now remember our parasympathetic ganglia are located either right outside or in some cases in the walls of the effectors. Uh, for instance, the heart is a great example. The parasympathetic ganglion in the heart is actually located embedded within the wall of the heart. Similarly, the liver, uh, the, or the stomach, uh, organs like that. Because of this, most, as we've learned, anatomists love to name everything. But even these nitpicky anatomists, when it comes to a little cluster of cells located in the wall of an organ, most of these ganglia are just simply called terminal ganglia. In fact, in the entire parasympathetic nervous system, only four ganglia have names. And as you can see from the illustration, all four are located in the head. And those four ganglia, as you can see here, are the pterygopalatine, ciliary, submandibular, and otic. All right, questions on this? All right, this gives us some good starting information, but I still think that this image can be a little intimidating. So what I find works best for really understanding this is to tease these pathways out. So let's do that. Let's go to our whiteboard clear this image. And let's, in a more organized fashion, identify these pathways. So I need to bring this down a little bit. I think that can work. We will remind ourselves up here at the top, we are talking about our parasympathetic. In, uh, pathways. Oops. There we go. So, if we think about it, obviously we need to start in the central nervous system. Uh, where, of course, our pre ganglionic. A cell body is located. So that's the first thing we have to worry about. 
Next, of course, we need to know what structure is formed by the axons. So what is it that the axons of the preganglionic neuron uh, forms? So let's actually do that. Next, we need to identify the ganglia of the parasympathetic nervous system. that in this, which is of course where the cell bodies body is located. Uh, what its axon forms neuron, and then, of course, the effectors. So let's spread this out well so we can fit all of this in here, making some semblance of sense. All right, perfect. So these are basically the steps. If you're an engineer, wiring this thing together, this is where we would begin, okay? Now, remember, as we talked about, our parasympathetic nervous system is located, uh, pardon me, is identified uh, anatomically as the cranial sacral region. So that means some of the preganglionic neurons are located in the brainstem. and some are located in the sacral spinal cord. And we can be more uh, specific, lateral gray horn of the sacral spinal cord. Actually, let's do it this way. Sacral spinal cord. And those that are in the sacral spinal cord, we know their cell bodies are located form our lateral gray horn. There you go, that makes more sense. Okay, so we have our sacral spinal cord whose cell bodies form the lateral gray horn. Uh, make sure I have enough room up top. And the others are found in the brainstem. Now, of course, as we know, the brainstem contains nuclei, clusters of cell bodies. And in this case, there are gonna be four specific, pardon me, three specific uh, nuclei that these are gonna be associated with. It is going to be the nucleus, of cranial nerve three. Someone remind me what cranial nerve three is again? The oculomotor. Excellent. A second is gonna be the nucleus of cranial nerve seven. Someone remind me what that one is again? Facial. And the third is the nucleus of cranial nerve nine. And someone remind me what that is again? 
Glossopharyngeal. Excellent. Someone's been studying their cranial nerves. Excellent, excellent. I love to hear that. Spectacular. And here's where things get really easy. If the cell bodies are located in the nuclei of these cranial nerves, guess what their axons form? What do you think the axons coming out of the nucleus for cranial nerve three form? It's not a trick question. The pregangliona? Well, it's gonna to go to a ganglion, but axons coming out of the brain stem associated with cranial nerve three, what do you think those axons are gonna become? How about cranial nerve three? There you go. Guess what the axons coming out of the nucleus associated with cranial nerve seven become? Seven. Cranial oh, nerve. And the ones coming out of nine. Yeah, you I told you guys it wasn't a trick question. Some of the questions are allowed to be easy on occasion. Uh, form, cranial nerve, nine. Excellent. Those are the easy ones, or at least I thought those were the easy ones. So let's talk about these ones in the spinal cord. The ones coming off the sacral region of the spinal cord, as we know, of course, when they leave, we know that they come out that ventral root. And as we know from the ventral root, they go to the spinal nerve, right? Because we know how those things work. We've talked about that anatomy. But then what they form as they leave that are a bundle of axons that we call the, the pelvic splanchnic nerves. Now, some of the textbooks have gone to just calling these pelvic nerves, and I will accept that if you just want to use pelvic nerves. But as we'll see, pelvic splanchnic is a useful term because it'll help us to be able to uh, distinguish and identify uh, the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So you may use either of those two terms, pelvic splanchnic nerves or splanchnic nerves. Uh, pardon me, or pelvic nerves, pelvic nerves or pelvic splanchnic nerves. Excellent. So that is the beginning of our pathways. Now, these things need to lead to ganglia where they are going to synapse. Now, remember, as we mentioned, most of the ganglia don't have names. Most of them, and in fact, all the ones associated with the sacral spinal cord are just what we call generic names for terminal ganglia. So these splanchnic nerves will go to a terminal ganglia where they were synapse. As they leave, they simply become a structure that we call a parasympathetic nerve. And this parasympathetic nerve coming out of the sacral spinal cord uh, as we go, if we cheat and go back to the picture, we can see basically innervates uh, one of three structures. It either innervates the urinary system, uh, the reproductive system, or it innervates the distal portion digestive system. And by distal digestive system, basically we mean the rectum and the anus.
So there you go. So notice, if you want to pee, if you want to poo, if you want to come, this is the pathway. Your parasympathetic nervous system sends a signal from your sacral spinal cord out that pelvic splanchnic nerve to a terminal ganglia associated with those organs where it synapses. It's then parasympathetic nerve goes to those structures and provides that input. And if we cheat and go back to the illustration, that is exactly what we see down here. Notice as we look at this pathway, as we were talking about before, starting in the sacral spinal cord, preganglionic neurons come out and form those pelvic nerves or what we also call the pelvic splanchnic nerves. And they go to the urinary system, to the reproductive system, or to the distal part of the digestive system. So just that easily, we have drawn the parasympathetic pathway to these three major groups of organs. All right. Questions on that? It only gets worse from here. So this, if, if this isn't making sense, say something now. I have a question. Yes. Um, so parasympathetic nervous system, isn't it usually more or less controlled subconsciously by our body without us making decisions? Yes. You Well, I mean, yes and no. Uh, yes, your process of producing and releasing urine, the process of reproduction, the process of defecation, uh, those are things that we are not voluntarily necessarily controlling. Although, there, with, again, for instance, with defecation and urination, we have control of a skeletal muscle sphincter so that when you feel the need to void, you don't void right away. But yes, most of these processes are controlled by autonomic nervous system, right? That's outside of our conscious control. And that's what this is. So I was, I was going to ask, why is it then that like some people can like hold their poop in all day and they like stop thinking about it and forget they have to go while others are like, OMG, I need to find a bathroom right now or else. Like, is that something that we consciously control or not at all? So again, let's, so <clears throat> we'll obviously talk about this much more when we get to the urinary system and digestive system, but here is the short version of this. You are constantly producing urine and that urine is going to your bladder and being stored to your bladder. When your bladder stretches to a certain size, it sends a signal to you that you need to release that urine from your bladder, all right? If you are in a car driving and you just pass the sign that says 30 miles to the next rest stop, you're obviously not gonna release right there. Or if you're only two hours into an eight hour shift of being a nurse, you're not necessarily gonna release it right then. And what happens is if you don't release it, your body habituates to the signal. It stops responding to that signal and the signal goes away. Then a little bit later, the signal comes back and the signal is stronger. And if you ignore it, again, it'll go away. And next time it comes back stronger. If you continue to ignore it, is it possible that it could get strong enough that the contractions could be strong enough where it forces you to void whether you need to or not? Can you be forced to defecate or forced to urinate even if you don't want to? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that happened once. Yeah, it is possible for that to happen, absolutely. However, if you are constantly holding it, constantly holding it, constantly holding it, like if you're a nurse 15, 20 years ago in the field uh, where you're working 10, 12 hour shifts and not given formal breaks, what can actually happen is your body can habituate to that signal so much that you no longer have a urinary reflex. Uh, there's a woman I know who worked as a nurse for 25 years who has lost her ability to urinate voluntarily. She has, every time she needs to void her, her, her bladder, which she has to do you know, two or three times a day, she has to insert a catheter to be able to do it because she has habituated that signal so much uh, that uh, she's no longer capable of voluntarily releasing her urine. She has to catheter herself to be able to do that. That's one of the reasons why uh, unions and things like that have gotten much more strict about breaks and things along those lines for nurses is because these are not uncommon things that happened 15, 20 years ago. 
So yes, it is possible to habituate to this, to strengthen those muscles to it, but it's not a good thing to keep holding it. Let it go. All right, excellent. I wanted to see the visual. I will go back to the picture because we have more to fill out, but I wanted just to see how this works, how this picture relates to these pathways that we just finished talking about. Now, remember also, as I mentioned, there are four uh, named ganglia. While most of the ganglia in the parasympathetic nervous system are um, terminal ganglia, just generic term terminal ganglia, there are some that have specific names. One of those is the ciliary. Ciliary ganglia happens to be the one associated with cranial nerve three. We actually saw this when we were looking at our cranial nerves for three. We actually saw this ganglia. We didn't name it at the time, but let's actually cheat and do that. Where's my cranial nerves? There it is. Remember back here when we were learning about cranial nerve three, four, and five, notice here, if we trace the path of cranial nerve three, it comes through, goes to many of the muscles we talked about, but notice it comes to this ganglion right here, which innervates the smooth muscle of the eye. And lo and behold, what ganglion is that? The ciliary ganglion. So, as we already learned when we were talking about our cranial nerves, that ciliary ganglia is innervated by cranial nerve three where it's synapses. Its axons leave and of course, just again form parasympathetic nerves. That's all we call these postganglionic axons. And as we just finished pointing out, the effector for this is the smooth muscle the eye. So if you want to focus your eye, or if you wanted to change the diameter of your pupil to allow light in and out, that would be the pathway for that. And notice, if we go back to our illustration, let's go ahead and actually let's do this first. I don't think I need the cranial nerve pictures anymore. So let's get rid of that because I've got too darn many things open. Again, notice here, we look at our pretty picture, we start in that preganglionic neuron who's located in the nucleus of the brainstem, his axon forms cranial nerve three, comes in synapses on our postganglionic neuron in our ciliary ganglia and innervates the eye. So that is our second major parasympathetic pathway. All right, questions on that? Now, remember we have four named ganglion and four cranial nerves. That seems kind of convenient until you look at this. Notice here we have cell bodies located in the brainstem whose axons form cranial nerve seven. But notice some of these axons from cranial nerve seven innervate one ganglion and some of the axons for cranial nerve seven innervate a second ganglion. So notice cranial nerve seven innervates not one, but two of these named ganglia. So let's go back and look at that. We now know cranial nerve seven innervates not one, but two ganglia. 
one of those, as we always know in a class like this, there's always going to be a big, huge alphabet soup term. We know we're going to have to spell at some point. And it's pterygopalantine ganglion. But as we often learn, names tell us everything about it. When I say the term pterygo or terry like that, what do you hear when I say terry? Tear. Tear's not a bad guess. What else sounds like terra like that? P-T, oh, I spelled it wrong. Like pterodactyl. Yeah, let me spell it right. P-T-E-R-Y. What's a pterodactyl? A flying dinosaur. A dinosaur. True, a dinosaur, and everybody remembers the wings first. It is a flying dinosaur. But what else is special about the pterodactyl? Makes a loud noise. Well, the picture it has a long nose. I mean, yeah, the nose looks like a nose. beak. It has that huge beak, that huge nose, and that's what terago refers to. Terra means beak, means nose. And so the terago palatine ganglion is going to innervate uh, the nasal cavity, all right, producing mucous membrane, the palate of the mouth. Uh, the mouth producing mucus in the mouth, and it also innervates our lacrimal gland, which does what again? Uh, produces produces tears exactly. So notice as we talked about. This pathway to produce tears, to produce mucus in our mouth and our nasal cavity is a completely different pathway for uh, focusing the pupils of our eye or urinating or defecating. All right, questions on that? Now, remember also some of our axons from cranial nerve seven innervate a ganglion called the submandibular. And our submandibular innervates salivary glands. We actually have three sets of salivary glands. And those three sets of salivary glands are actually innervated by two different cranial nerves. So one of those pathways is cranial nerve seven through our submandibular forming a parasympathetic nerve. Which then goes to our salivary gland. And let's move this up a little bit if I can. Our cranial nerve nine goes to a ganglion known as the otic ganglion. And that otic ganglion and its parasympathetic nerves also goes to salivary glands. So here are our four named ganglia and the pathways associated with them.
Notice we've gone to a fair amount of stuff, but we haven't gone to nearly everything yet. And that's because remember there's one more cranial nerve. We have preganglionic neurons that are located in the nucleus of cranial nerve 10. And someone remind me what cranial nerve 10 is? The vagus. Vagus nerve. And remember, as we mentioned before, about 90% of our parasympathetic output comes out this vagus nerve. The axons of these, of course, form cranial nerve 10. And cranial nerve 10, remember as we talked about before, innervates most of the organs of the abdominal pelvic, I mean, pardon me, of the ventral body cavity. But now we can be more specific. Heart, lungs, stomach, liver, gallbladder, spleen, pancreas, uh, small intestine, and the proximal part of the large intestine. Notice not the rectum, not the anus, because remember that's part of the sacral pathway. But all these organs, pretty much most of the organs of the ventral body cavity are innervated by cranial nerve 10. And as we've talked about, most of these are gonna be located in the organ or right next to the organ. So even though this is 90% of the output, all of the ganglia are just terminal ganglia. Just given that generic name. Again, the only parasympathetic ganglia that have names are ones that are found in our head. So there you go. Just that simply, we have diagrammed here all of the possible pathways for our parasympathetic nervous system to get to any of the organs of the body that it affects. So on the exam, could I ask for you to describe to me the pathway by which the parasympathetic nervous system caused the eye to dilate? increased defecation, made the stomach re uh, release more uh, gastric you know, juice, reduced saliva, cried, any of those things? And should you be able to describe this? Absolutely. Yes. Yep. And again, notice now that we've done this here, when we go back to that scary looking octopus, it's not so scary anymore because now we can very clearly see what we have been doing this whole time. Notice again, preganglionic neuron located in the brainstem in red, preganglionic axon coming out and synapsing in our ciliary ganglion on that postganglionic neuron that then innervates the eye or our vagus nerve, preganglionic neuron going all the way to the heart, to the lungs, to the liver, to the gallbladder, to the stomach, to the pancreas, to the spleen, to the small intestine, to the large intestine. And notice for pretty much all of them, the ganglia are either inside the organ or right next to the organ. So they're just unnamed terminal ganglia. And our sacral, 
preganglionic neuron located in the central nervous system in the lateral gray horn. Axon forms those pelvic splanchnic nerves and goes to something like the reproductive organs where it terminates on a terminal ganglia, controlling sperm production, controlling erection, controlling urination or defecation or any of those types of things. This really does a nice job of showing these pathways. All right. For cranial nerves, ocular motor, facial, glossopharyngeal, vagus, four named ganglia. Although, like I said, that is a teeny bit tricky because the four named ganglia only go with these first three cranial nerves. Because remember, seven gets two. Some of seven's axons go to the pterygopalatine. Some of it go to the submandibular. And I made a mess of this. Notice here's that great picture showing these pathways as well. So notice again, ciliary cranial nerve three goes to the smooth muscle of the eye. Pterygopalatine goes to the lacrimal gland and to the nasal cavity. Submandibular goes to some of our salivary glands and the otic goes to the other. Here, we get a better view of that vagus output, 90% of our parasympathetic output, and all the things that it goes to. Heart, oops, that didn't work. Heart, lungs, liver and gallbladder, stomach, pancreas. Where's the spleen? Spleen should be in here, spleen. Small intestine, all of it, and the proximal part of the large intestine. Whereas our sacral pathway with those pelvic splanchnic nerves, as I mentioned, sometimes they call them pelvic splanchnic, sometimes they just call them pelvic, both are fine. They start in the lateral gray horn, going to the rectum and anus, to the reproductive organs and to the urinary system. I can't forget about the sacral part. We did that as well. All very local discrete innervations. Very straightforward pathways, giving us that, that precise local control. Questions on that? Uh, I want to ask something about the vagus nerve. Yes. Well, uh, I don't know if I remember this correctly. Uh, when I was taking anatomy class in my country, so uh, one thing that I remember from vagus nerve, uh, my professor told me it, it was located parallel to ear canal, I think. And that, and that is why if you like try to clean your ears with Q-tip, sometimes you cough uh, because you put pressure on that nerve. And uh, that actually happened to me when I tried to like, <laughs> In my ears with the Q-tip, I started coughing. Interesting. Um, what I would say is that the vague, that, that wouldn't necessarily be a vagus nerve effect. What I'm guessing is more happening is that it might be influencing your phrenic nerve. Remember the phrenic nerve is the one we talked about that influences the diaphragm. So it could be more that you'd be innervating that the vagus nerve doesn't, because again, remember vagus nerve like nine and uh, 11 all come out the jugular foramen much lower than that. Whereas uh, seven and eight, and for that matter, the phrenic nerve, which is the spinal one coming off the cervical surplex are more superior. So my guess is that it, it might be more likely that it was that, but uh but no, I haven't heard that before. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it... Here's what I'll say. I won't say no, uh, but I'm not familiar with that. And my suspicion is that there are some other nerves that might be more likely to be involved in that than the vagus nerve. Uh, because again, as you can see, the vagus nerve innervates a whole lot of stuff. So why would it just specifically be the lungs? Uh, whereas the phrenic nerve, as we know, innervates the diaphragm. So that that... Just that that stimulation of that would be much more likely to cause some type of uh, of 
interruption of the normal breathing process, like a cough or a hiccup or something like that. Okay. Yeah, maybe I just don't remember which nerve that was exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Very interesting question. That's really cool. I had not heard of that before. All right. Any other questions on these parasympathetic pathways? All right, let's come back to this simple picture of the octopus we saw before. And look, lo and behold, we see the same kind of thing. Notice from the sacral spinal cord, we have these uh, pelvic splanchnic nerves that go to things like the bladder, go to things like the genitals. Notice the ganglia and the synapses occurring inside of the organ. Whereas, for instance, to our salivary gland and our eye, they're occurring outside the organ because that's where those name ganglia are located. And notice again, our vagus nerve is going to the heart and the lungs and the stomach and the pancreas and a bunch of other stuff like that as well. So we see much longer preganglionic neurons, much shorter uh, postganglionic neurons, and much more discrete pathways. Compare that to what we see have going on on the other side. Notice most of the ganglia are right next to and parallel to the spinal cord or a little bit offset from them. Because of that, notice our darker preganglionic uh, axons are much, much shorter where they're synapsing, whereas our postganglionic, the latter colors, are much longer going to their destinations. Notice there's a lot more overlap of synapses in here. So whereas there's only one driving direction to get to the stomach here, notice I could get to the stomach by going this way, or I could get to the stomach by going this way, or I could get to the stomach by going this way. All right, there's uh, many, many routes I could take to get to the stomach with this one because there's a lot more overlap, a lot more elaborate branching. And notice as we've also talked about, there's things like the adrenal gland, things like the skin, that we know the sympathetic innervate that our parasympathetic doesn't. So we can start to see hints of the differences of these in this pathway, but we do need to do look a little deeper, delve a little deeper to make sense of our sympathetic pathway. So let's start here for now. But again, looking at our time, I want you to be fresh because things get more challenging from here because the pathways aren't quite as straightforward. So let's come at this information as fresh as we can. Let's go ahead and take our second break. It is 2.18 now. So let's come back at 2.33. And at 2.33, we will restart from there. All right, so that is the game plan. Take a 15 minute break, come back fresh and start tackling our sympathetic nervous system. Any questions? All right, see you in 15 minutes. You guys have had a few minutes to think about this. Any questions on the parasympathetic nervous system before we move on to the sympathetic? So basically the point of that table you, you showed us was just to have us understand that the where like the um, cranial nerves, they go to the parasymp parasympathetic pathways to form all these kind of different kind of effectors. If that makes yeah. sense. What I'm basically what we need to understand is how the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, which again, remember are motor branches of the nervous system, how it is that they get to and innervate the organs that they need to affect. And so as we saw here in this illustration, and then we just did it on that simple schematic that I did, we were able to see how our nervous system would communicate with an organ like the stomach or the salivary glands or the heart or whatever it is to have that rest and digest type of response. And so now that we understand this pathway in the parasympathetic, 
we need to do the same thing to understand how it is that the sympathetic is going to innervate all the organs as well, because it's a different pathway. All right. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So any other great question? Any others before we dive in? All right, then let us begin. In some ways, very small ways, uh, the sympathetic nervous system is a teeny bit easier. And one of the ways that it's easier is it starts more locally. Here in the spinal cord, in the lateral gray horns, the lateral gray horn of all of the thoracic segments and the first two or three lumbar segments is where all of our pre, whoops, that's not how you spell pre, preganglionic neuron cell bodies are located. So all of our pathways, as elaborate and, and dynamic as the pathways of the sympathetic nervous system can be, they all begin in the lateral gray horn uh, of our spinal cord between T1 and L2 or 3. So not surprisingly, if the parasympathetic is the cranial sacral, because it comes off of there, when we talk about the anatomical name, The anatomical name of the sympathetic nervous system, we refer to it as thoracolumbar. All right, so that is a good starting point. Now, unlike the sympathetic, uh, pardon me, unlike the parasympathetic, where only four ganglia have names and the rest are just terminal ganglia, all of the ganglia of the sympathetic nervous system have names. So all of them have names. And there are two main types. The first are what are called chain ganglia. Let's look if I spell chain correctly. These chain ganglia are also sometimes known as trunk ganglia, you may hear the term. Uh, they are also known as the, uh, uh, pardon me, not the collateral. They are also known as the paravertebral. Paravertebral means along the side of, because while this, this illustration does a decent job of showing them, what this illustration doesn't show is that these are paired ganglia. What do you think I mean when I say paired ganglia? There's two, two of each on each exactly. side. Exactly. So there is another row of ganglia over here on the right side of the brainstem as well. And that's why they're called paravertebral. We have these two rows of them that run parallel right alongside of the spinal cord. And I believe I have a nice picture that shows this. Here's one of them. Notice here we see on this side, how they're all linked together like a chain, which is where it gets its name. But notice also on the other side, there is another chain. And even though we can't see it, we know it's going along the other side of the spinal cord as well. So there's two, they're paired. And as you can see, they basically run parallel to the spinal cord. So these are the paired 
uh, paravertebral, or what are known as chain ganglia. But, and again, this picture doesn't do the best job of showing this, so we will cheat. Notice how there are some nerves that are coming out of here and coming off from the other side as well and coming to the middle of the vertebrae in front of the spinal cord. There are three ganglia that are located in front. the spinal cord. As such, they're called the prevertebral ganglia, or they are also known as the collateral ganglia. And there are three of them, and I'll give you their names. They're the celiac, not to be mistaken with the ciliary. Remember, ciliary was the parasympathetic in the eye. Superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric. Now, these are in order from superior to inferior. So if these are in order from superior to inferior, why is the superior mesenteric in the middle? Shouldn't that be the one on the top? No, because the celiac comes before the superior mesenteric and they're probably similar because they're superior and inferior of the same type. Yep. Do you know why? You're absolutely 100% correct. Do you know why they have these names? I think because the celiac goes to a specific area or like a specific organ system, whereas like the other two, one does like the top half of the same system, the other one does the bottom half. You are absolutely correct. That is absolutely 100% correct. And what's also cool about that is not surprisingly, nerves and blood vessels go to the same place. That's, yep. Okay. And so these ganglia are actually named by the blood vessels they sit next to. And so they're named by the blood vessels. There's a celiac artery, there's a superior mesenteric artery, and an inferior mesenteric artery, and they sit right next to those. But you're also 100% correct that they go to very specific parts of the body. So we will definitely come back to that and talk about that and see that, uh, but we have that there. So there's these two different types, prevertebral and paravertebral are what are also known as chain and collateral ganglia. So let's take a look at these starting with the chain first or paravertebral. They are named, but they're named in a similar way to our vertebrae. They're named by the vertebrae they're associated with. So there can be cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. And there happen to be uh, somewhere, it varies from person to person, but somewhere between eight and 12 thoracic. So they would be called T1, T2, T3, T4, and so on and so forth. Everybody has about four to five lumbar. Everybody has about four to five sacral. And so notice these kind of vary in the numbers you can have. So notice, for instance, on this particular strand right here, if I pointed to this one and we counted out, would I know for certain whether that was T9 or whether it was L2? Do you think it's possible to know that just by looking at it? Not necessarily, no. No, not necessarily. So for these, it's a little bit tricky. But the good news is that there are almost always three cervical, and so we will give them more specific names. And there is only one coccygeal, and that coccygeal does something special as well. So we'll talk about that as well. Let's take a closer look at these. Here's another nice pretty picture that shows this. And notice this one 
does do a nice job of showing us this uh, path, these, these paired -ness. So we have two rows of these side by side. Notice also as we're looking at this up here, uh, we can see that there are three cervical chain ganglia. They are the superior, which is the top one, the middle, and the inferior. And notice if you look closely at the illustration, again, remember one of the important things to remember about our sympathetic nervous system is it elaborately branches and there are big mass overlappings to the pathways. But even with that big overlapping pathway, there are still some general paths that we can talk about. And one of those general paths, as you can see here, involves our superior uh, chain ganglion. Notice our superior, uh, I wanted that to be green. Our superior chain ganglion basically innervates anything that the sympathetic nervous system needs to do in the head. So our, our superior cervical chain ganglion, and that's a mouthful, so let's write it out. A superior cervical chain ganglion provides our sympathetic input to the head. Whereas, oops, I don't want that to stick green. Notice our middle and our inferior innervate the heart and the lungs. Oops. All right. Questions on that? I think I'm getting a little mixed up and confused um, between, didn't you say there's two different kinds for the sympathetic system? Did we already cover the first? And is this the second? No, these chain ganglia are the first. The second, remember, were the prevertebral, the collateral ganglia, which if you uh, take a peek at this illustration, you will see there's the ciliac ganglion, there's the superior mesenteric ganglion, there's the inferior mesenteric ganglion. So we're not talking about these three yet. We're still talking about our chain ganglion. So okay. Our thanks. Chain ganglion. So far, we've talked about three of them, the superior, the middle, and the inferior cervical chain ganglia. We know what they innervate. The superior cervical chain innervates basically everything of the head. Uh, the middle and inferior, basically the organs of the thoracic cavity. So notice basically these chain ganglia innervate two things. First is the internal organs above the diaphragm. And we haven't identified it yet, but I will tell you right now, the second thing that these chain ganglion innervate is the skin. So basically all the rest of these ganglia the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacral, all of these all innervate the skin. And I have some pretty pictures that show this. So let's take a look. 
We'll come back to that in a second. Here, we see our three cervical chain ganglia. Notice our superior cervical chain ganglia innervates basically everything of the head, smooth muscle, skin, all the glands, anything internal of the head. Now notice, again, we know this is big and global. So if you notice, there is a tiny minor input to the heart, but mostly it goes to the head. Conversely, our middle and inferior basically go to all the organs and the skin of the thoracic cavity, everything from the diaphragm up. And the rest of the chain ganglia, which as I mentioned, can vary from person to person. The rest of the chain ganglia give that sympathetic function of the skin. They go to the sweat glands, they go to the erector pili muscles, they go to the adipose, they go to the blood vessels, right? All those things we talked about, those sympathetic functions of the skin, it is these chain ganglia that get there. Now, I did mention that one coccygeal, so I wanna sneak back to this picture really fast. Notice that one coccygeal from each side actually fuse together at the midline, forming a structure we call the ganglion impar. So while they start parallel to each other, they do come together. So basically it forms a big, huge U-shaped structure because those two paired uh, coccygeal ganglia fuse together. And as we just finished talking about, basically all the organs above the diaphragm and all of the skin. All right. Notice that still leaves us everything below the diaphragm in our abdominal pelvic cavity. And that is what our prevertebral or collateral ganglia do. Oh, I like this picture too. Notice here, this is a great top-down view showing us those chain ganglia right around the side. And notice one other thing as we look at that chain ganglia. The Ramey communicantes connect to the chain ganglia. Remember, we said they were going to be part of our sympathetic pathway. And someone remind me again what the lateral ramus here is called? We had different names for the lateral and the medial ramus. What was the lateral one? I'll give you a hint. One was white and one was gray. Which one was lateral, the white one or the gray one? The gray one. Close. The white one. The white one is lateral. The gray one is medial. There we go. And here we actually see that. Notice here, we see the white ramus is lateral, the gray ramus is medial, coming to those chain ganglia. Excellent. So our three remaining ganglia, those prevertebral, those collateral ganglia, and again, I know the illustration pushes these off to the side, but remember they're located right here in front of the uh, spinal cord. Uh, so they're actually just misplaced because uh, again, for the illustration, there are three. And notice as we talked about, the superior one is the celiac, then the superior mesenteric, and then the inferior mesenteric. And remember they're named based on the blood vessels that they sit next to.
And as someone pointed out, uh, I don't remember who it was that said it. Uh, someone was mentioning about how when we talk about the function of these, so let's actually put this up here so it's out of my way. If we follow and trace the pathways, we can see the structures that each of these uh, innervate. And let's start easy with the inferior mesenteric. Notice our inferior mesenteric goes to the distal part of the digestive system, right? So the rectum and anus goes to the urinary system, goes to the reproductive system. So notice the inferior mesenteric goes to the urinary system, goes to the reproductive system, and the uh, rectum and anus. Just like we saw with the splanchnic, uh, pelvic splanchnic nerves of the um, parasympathetic. So there's some similarity there. As was hinted at, superior mesenteric is related to the inferior mesenteric, where if we notice as we look at that and follow it, the superior mesenteric goes to the small intestine and the proximal large intestine. And as you can see, the celiac, kind of like the vagus nerve, goes to most everything else below the diaphragm. So this is the stomach. Uh, this is the liver. This is the gallbladder. This is the spleen. This is the pancreas. So notice all of those organs, right? liver, stomach, gallbladder, spleen, pancreas, all of those are innervated by the celiac ganglion. So these three unpaired prevertebral ganglia or collateral ganglia innervate the organs of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now, I can tell two things. You're all quiet because A, you're tired, and B, this is exhausting material, and I fully understand and appreciate that. But as I also mentioned, it is important information. One of the things that I think will help is if we do something similar to what we did before, and here's again more of that collateral ganglia, talking about the important pathways. Now, as I said, these pathways are much more global, much more overlapping, but in general, there are four main sympathetic pathways. Your book does explain all three of them, although it does a better job of describing three of them and kind of, uh, it mentions the fourth, but it doesn't emphasize it the same way. These are important pathways that we are gonna work together to learn. And I guarantee you, you are going to be asked this information on the exam. One of your essay questions on the exam is going to be to describe one of these four sympathetic pathways. So even though you're tired, it is still relatively early. I want to do the first one of these pathways. And if we can describe the first one of these pathways, you can understand what is expected of you. So you can start looking ahead at this for Thursday. And to make it easier, unlike what we did in the previous one, where we just wrote it out with words like a schematic, I'm going to actually draw this one. Obviously, drawing it is not something you can do on the exam. So when we come back on Thursday, we'll write this out schematically as well. But I want to draw it for today so we can kind of see and visualize. And notice here, this picture that is in the field of view in front of you is what we're going to be working with. So let's go ahead and draw this. First thing we wanna do is draw this and label all of the structures we're gonna be responsible for. Now I want some plain room. So I'm gonna cheat and take my spinal cord and only look at half of it because after all, we only need half of it anyway.
All right. We know coming off the spinal cord, we have our dorsal root that has its dorsal root ganglion. We know we have a ventral root. That comes up and wow, I did a really bad job of that. Let's actually cheat and do this. And they're gonna to come together to form the spinal nerve. So let's start again by labeling things we know. Dorsal root, ventral root, dorsal root ganglion, which is also a good reminder for all the anatomy that you're responsible for as well. So that's the other advantage of doing all of this stuff. Spinal nerve. And as we know, our spinal nerve branches, how many times? What was the I don't know, I wasn't paying attention either. Or how many times does the spinal nerve branch? 31? Four times. Four times. You're right, there are 31 oh. spinal nerves, but it branches four times. Excellent. Forms four main branches. Excellent. One of those branches is, of course, our dorsal ramus. We have our ventral ramus. We have, we know our lateral white ramus. And we have our gray ramus. We also know that our white and gray ramus lead to a chain ganglion. Now, here we have one chain ganglion, but as we know, chain ganglion don't hang out here by themselves. There's a whole row of them next to the spinal cord. And again, this is where my drawing skills are going to fail us. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, uh, rather than drawing them in a straight line going up and down the way they should be and looking all pretty in shade and do all of that kind of junk, I will totally and completely cheat uh, by just having them going off to the side. So, oops, no, I want that to be. Purple. I want that to be black. So here, this would be, for instance, going up to an ascending chain ganglia. And then this one down here would be going down to a descending chain ganglion. So this is the ascending chain. This is the descending chain. And this is another chain ganglion. And this is yet a third chain ganglion. Excellent. But we also know that chain ganglion aren't the only type of ganglia. Over here in front of the vertebrae, and I guess I moved it a little bit too much into the side here, uh, we have our um, collateral ganglia. So we know we have those there as well. I think these are all of the anatomical features we have identified and described so far. There are a couple more we need to talk about, but I think this is enough for our good starting point. All right, so any questions on the anatomy that you see here? Anything confusing? Anything we need to talk about before we get started? Excellent, stun silence means we understand it. Let's move forward. Now, as I pointed out, there are four main sympathetic pathways that we are gonna be responsible for on this exam. 
So let's identify those starting with the first one. This one we're going to describe first. And the pathway we are going to describe first based on the effector is how we're going to define it. That effector is going to be the skin. Anything associated with the skin, erector pili muscles, glands, right, blood vessels, adipose, any of those types of things. All right. Now, let's start with some easy questions. We know we need a preganglionic neuron. And I think we've been using red for those, although I honestly don't remember. Where is the cell body of the preganglionic neurons located? The anterior gray. This is autonomic, so would it be anterior gray horn? Or is lateral. Lateral gray horn. Excellent. What is the structural classification of this neuron? Multipole. Exactly. So here we have a multi, nope. Here we have a multipolar neuron with its dendrites. And its axon, when it leaves, oops, excellent. Its axon, when it leaves, where is it going to leave? What structure does it exit into or form as it leaves the spinal cord? The, the ventral structure. root. Ventral root, oh, so now I've heard both, dorsal root and ventral root. Which one is motor? The dorsal root. Well, dorsal root ganglion reminds us that these are where our sensory neurons are located. So remember motor yeah, the is ventral. The ventral root. There you go, ventral root. So notice it's gonna come out the ventral root to the spinal nerve. So if we're measuring its pathway, it goes out the ventral root to the spinal nerve. Now we know one other piece of information about our axon of the preganglionic neuron. Is it myelinated or unmyelinated? Myelin. Myelinated, excellent. So since it has this big chunk of fat on its surface, all of these big myelinations along the surface, if it's gonna form a structure as it travels to that chain ganglion, is it more likely to form something that we would call a gray ramus or something that we would call a white ramus? Well, it's got myelin on it and myelin's fat. So is myelin it's more like white. To give it a gray color or a white color? There you go. White, white color, white matter. White ramus, exactly. So that myelinated axon travels down the white ramus. Excellent. Now, which of our two types of ganglia did we say innervated the skin? Collateral ganglia or chain ganglia? Chain? Chain. So it's going to want a synapse here in our chain. Now, remember, this is the sympathetic nervous system. So being the sympathetic nervous system, it's going to branch elaborately. So some branches will go up to synapse. Some branches will go down to synapse. We're not going to worry about all of that. We're just going to form one synapse here. And of course, what neurotransmitter does this release? Acetylcholine. And what is the effect? Excitatory or inhibitory? Excitatory. Excitatory. Excellent. And it is going to be excitatory on our post-ganglionic neuron. Oops, nope. Too much blue. Excellent. Our post-ganglionic neuron. Uh, cell body 
is in the chain ganglion. Excellent. Let's make this blue to match. All right, excellent. What is its structural classification? Multipolar. Also multipolar. Excellent. It is also multipolar. Uh, its axon, myelinated or unmyelinated? Unmyelinated. Unmyelinated. Excellent. So we have a multipolar neuron here whose cell body is located here in the ganglion. It is multipolar and it has an unmyelinated axon. Now, remember we wanna to get to the skin and we're not gonna to get to skin randomly. We're gonna to want to go to a specific region. In fact, we have a special name for that specific region of the skin regions of the skin. We call them dermatomes. What branches of nerves did we already talk about go to specific regions of the body, like the front, like the back, like the arm? They involve plexis. The brachial plexus. Yeah, which is formed by ventral rami. If I wanted to go make the hair on the, my back stand up, it would be the dorsal rami. So notice if I want to get to dermatomes, I have to go, I have to help to form or go to the dorsal and ventral rami. So if I am this postganglionic neuron here, whose axon is unmyelinated, and I need to get back to the dorsal ramus or the ventral ramus, would my unmyelinated axon be more likely to form a white ramus or a gray ramus? Gray ramus? Gray ramus. Out the gray ramus, where it will go either to the ventral ramus or the dorsal ramus, where it will go to the effectors of the skin. And what neurotransmitter is it most likely going to release? Is it norepinephrine? There you go, norepinephrine. And again, I don't care how you spell it as long as you, uh, as long, I mean, I don't care how you pronounce it as long as you spell it correctly. <laughs> norepinephrine. Excellent, norepinephrine. And again, depending on the effector, it can either be excitatory or inhibitory, right? If it's the sweat gland, it's going to be active. If it's the erector pili muscle, it's going to be active. If it's, you know, things like that. So there you go. Just that simply, we have identified the pathway, the structures that these axons form, where our synapse takes place, what neurotransmitter is released by that synapse, right here in the synapse. We were releasing acetylcholine and it was excitatory. And then up here, we released the norepinephrine and it could be excitatory or inhibitory depending on the effector. We've done it with a visualization, but we've also labeled all of the structures and this is our first possible pathway. All right, questions on that. So there you go. Just that simply, we have now identified one of the four possible pathways you are gonna be responsible for on the exam. And this picture I'll save. Questions on that? All right, excellent. That is our game plan.
So on Thursday, we will identify the remaining three pathways. And I appreciate that. There's a lot of information that we're covering, but your book does a nice job of describing this as well. So now you know what is expected of you. I encourage you to look at the lecture slides. I encourage you to look at the textbook. I encourage you to look at all the other resources that are available for you so that hopefully this will make a little bit more sense when we're doing it on Thursday. All righty. We're already done. We're already done for today. I know it is a little bit early, but that is all I wanted to do for the lecture. Again, I wanted to do oh. a little bit of histology still, but I wanted to stop the lecture for that. Yes, we will briefly review this one on Thursday before we do before we do the uh, before we go on to the other ones as well. All right. Questions on that. So I have a general question. Yeah. Um, we're covering so much material and I know all the printed out lab handouts and class handouts um, you usually say we're responsible for on the exam. But I emailed you this morning a bunch of information to confirm I got it right and you said it may, may not be on the exam. So now I'm a little lost as to what exactly to focus on. What you emailed me were the brain exits for the cranial nerves, right? Remember, for the cranial nerves and the cranial nerve handouts, there are basically four pieces of information I will hold you responsible for on the cranial nerves. You need to know the cranial nerves by name and number. You need to know the functional type of the cranial nerves, which gets a little easier because there's only three possible right answers, sensory, motor, or both. You need to know the specific functions of the cranial nerves, and you need to know their skull exit. What hole in the skull do they pass through to get to their destination? Those were the four pieces of information. The handout I gave you had a fifth column. That fifth column was, uh, I think it's labeled brain exit. But basically it was a place where you could write down when you look at the brain stem, when you look at the inferior view of the brain, how do you describe where that nerve comes off of? I'm not gonna ask you what the brain exit of cranial nerve four is, but if you can remember that cranial nerve four is the one that comes off the posterior side, right? And so it wraps around laterally above the, um, above the pons, then when you look at that, you can see, ah, uh, there's the lateral one above the pons, that must be four. So it was just that specific piece of information, the brain exits that I'm not holding you responsible for. You're responsible for everything else on that handout. Okay, thank you, that clarified. Yep, excellent. All right, any other questions? And Ariana, you're welcome. It's a lot of information, but uh, thank you. <laughs> it is, excellent. So. Let's go back then. The last thing, that, because like I said, I, this is the, I'm done with lecture. I want this to sit. I want you to sit with this. I want you to look at this information so that hopefully it will hopefully make more sense when we do it on Thursday, but I wanted to introduce it today. But the one thing that we haven't had a chance to do yet that I wanted to get back to is the histology. I know we've talked about the histology a lot. We've looked at illustrations of this. We've done other things of it, but I really want to go over it again and make sure we really emphasize and understand the histology. So I have this histology and I wanted to, to briefly go over uh, reviewing the stuff that we've already done, but also go on to some of the other things that we haven't had a chance to emphasize as much to make sure that we've seen it and we are familiar with it. So again, our, our understanding is uh, histology. There's a fair amount more on this one than there was on the previous test. Remember, we started last time by talking about the cerebellum. We recognize the cerebellum because it has those big nooks and crannies like the cerebrum. But the way we can tell this is the cerebellum is because it has not one, but two layers of gray matter. So remind me some vocabulary again. What do we call a raised ridge on the cerebellum? Folium. Gyri? Folium. Gyri. Remember, it's a gyrus on the cerebrum, but a folium on the cerebellum. Yeah. So what do we call the invagination, the groove? 
sulcus, excellent. Uh, notice like the cerebrum, the gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside. But notice also with our cerebellum, our white matter forms this big elaborate, dare I even say tree looking type of structure. So what is that fancy name we give for the white matter collectively of the cerebellum? The arbor vitae. Arbor vitae, excellent, the tree of life. And lastly, right here, even though you can't see it on this particular magnification, right here on the border between the two layers of the gray matter is a cell. What cell do we find? There we go, Purkinje cells, perfect, right? Beat me to the punch, absolutely. And like all the cells, we have a location in between the two layers of the gray matter. So that means we also know its structural classification and its functional classification. What is the structural classification of this Purkinje cell? Kind of. Is it unipolar? Well, let's see, if, is function easier? What's the function of this neuron found inside the cerebellum? No, this one both's not, but this one here, I see where you're going with both in that it is between the sensory and the motor. But remember in this case, that makes it an interneuron. My handwriting, not so good with this. Excellent interneuron. So structurally, what does that make it? Multipolar. Multipolar, absolutely. And remember, we saw if we increase the magnification, we can see those cells right on the border. Here's a nice big, huge row of them. You can see lots and lots of them right here on the border in between. And I think we had a couple other pictures. Here's a higher magnification view where we see the cells really, really well. And we can see some of the processes coming off. But remember, as we talked about when we use that electron microscope with, or not like a fluorescent microscope with fluorescent dyes, we can see all the big elaborate trees. And there's that bikini bottom uh, trees that you were talking about. Those big, huge, fancy dendritic trees that they have. And then their axons go into the white matter at the center. Excellent. Yes, Arthur, you had a question. Yeah, on the nervous system histology handout that I accidentally did, um, it asked for cell body and Purkinje cell, and the difference is a cell body is collectively both the axons and the dendrites it forms. No, right? well, so, okay. First, let me stop you. This is definitely testable material. So taking the time to draw it out and to learn this definitely is not an accident. That is what you should be doing. But you have the right idea. This right here is the cell body. Right, it's a neuron, so we know it also has dendrites and it also has an axon that leaves from it and goes this way. So this is a neuron that has three parts, dendrites, cell body, and an axon. So technically this thing right here is the cell body, whereas the whole cell is a Purkinje cell. That uh, makes sense. All right. What is this structure? A spinal cord. Excellent. Identify the space. Central canal. Identify the neuroglial cell that lines that space. Ependymal cells. Excellent. Identify the groove. Anterior, yeah, anterior sulcus. Yeah, remember this is the deep one. So it is an anterior median fissure. fissure, whereas the one up here is the posterior median sulcus. Excellent. Identify the region. 
posterior posterior root ramus. Is it a horn? Posterior gray horn. Excellent. It's not very big, but what region is this? Lateral horn. Okay. And of course, this is the anterior horn. Anterior gray horn. Excellent. Identify the structure. Dorsal root. Dorsal root. Identify the structure. Okay. Ventral root. Excellent. Identify the structure. Excellent. So notice once again, we have a ganglion. So this is a place where cells are going to be located. We have a location. So even though I can't make out the individual cells here, I know this location. And so that is going to tell me the structural and the functional uh, ca uh, uh, characteristics of these neurons. What is the structural classification of the neurons found in the dorsal root ganglion? Unipolar. There you go. And what is their function? Sensor. Notice we could do the same thing with a different location, like the anterior gray horn. We have a location. And again, that's going to give us a structural classification and a functional classification. What is the structural classification of the neurons found in the anterior gray horn? Multipolar. And what is their functional classification? So Amanda mentioned motor, uh, which many of you did on your 15 point nervous review and you only got partial credit for that. Why? Autonomic motor. Autonomic here in the anterior gray horn? Somatic motor. Somatic, Somatic motor, excellent. Because notice we could do the exact same thing a third time with the lateral gray horn. Lateral gray horn is the location. What is the structural classification of neurons found in the lateral gray horn? Multi, I want to say multi. And you would be correct. That's why you want to say multipolar. And what are the functional classification? There we go. I think that was question 14, which is ironic. Most of you got 14 correct. You had no problem with the autonomic motor, but for the anterior gray horn, most of you just said motor. So again, here we can be specific, we can be precise. We can see these structures. Uh, and if we know location, we know what the neurons are that are there and what they do. Location, structure, function, hand in hand in hand. Now, one of the things on your slide is, uh, on your histology that you're responsible for, is a spinal cord smear. Guess how you make a spinal cord smear? You smear um, spinal cord? Yeah. You basically take the spinal cord and you smear it on a slide. The advantage of doing that is it breaks apart the tissue and allows you to see the cells. Now notice, let's cheat and go back to the previous picture. Notice by far the biggest structure of the spinal cord is the anterior gray horn. So not surprisingly, when we see these neurons, these are most likely the neurons from the anterior gray horn. And notice something else about it. The nice thing about this particular prep is by separating them out, it allows me to start to count the processes. So notice this neuron, for instance, has one, has two, has three, has four, has five. This one has one, has two, has three. Looks like another one that may have broken off there. And really, after I get to three, do I even have to keep counting at that point? No. 
No, because for all of these neurons, what is their structural classification? Multipolar. Excellent. They're all going to be multipolar. Right. And if I know this is a spinal cord smear, that tells me my location is most likely these were from the anterior gray horn, which means what is their function going to be? Somatic motor. There you go. Function, structure, location, hand in hand in hand. Now, I do want to point a couple other things out to you on this slide. Notice, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and erase all of this. Um, notice here, let's draw it. One of the interesting things about these cells as you look at them is normally when we look at a cell, the darkest thing is the nucleus. But notice on these cells, the darkest thing isn't the nucleus. There are definitely some dark spots in the nucleus. And what are those dark spots inside the nucleus? Is it the, um, the Golgi bodies that were nissle, nissle bodies? Those wouldn't be in the nucleus. What are the dark spots in the nucleus? Remember, we get that condensing of stuff because the, the proteins are being made. Transcription is taking place. What did we call that really dense uh, structure of material inside the nucleus? Nucleolus. Nucleolus. So we have that nucleolus that we see, but you hit it on the head. Notice that the darkest material is actually all of this dark stained material inside the cell body. And that, you're right, is the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or what also we call the Golgi bodies, because remember, it's that Golgi stain that makes them stand out so darkly. Notice one last thing as well. All these tiny little dots. Any idea what these tiny little dots might be? Neuroglia. Yeah, they're the neuroglial cells. Now, by just staring at their nucleus, can we tell what kind of neuroglial cell they are? No. no. But we know generically they're the neuroglial cells. So all the tiny little dots of the neuroglial cells, we're not able to tell what they are. But these are the things that we can see on this. And I think I have one more higher magnification view. Excellent. Notice again, we can, hold on. Let me, uh, yes, go ahead, Arthur. Quick question, uh, Golgi bodies and Nissle bodies are interchangeable, right? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I, I said Golgi bodies, you are correct. It's Nissle bodies, Nissle bodies, I misspoke, right? And I apologize, the, the Nissle bodies and then the rough endoplasmic reticulum, interchangeable, those are interchangeable. So I apologize, that was on me, yes. Yeah, so Nissle body or uh, it's the Nissle stain, Nissle body or the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Notice again, we see the nucleoli, we see the, uh, the neuroglial cells. This is clearly a multipolar neuron. We see lots of processes, but notice here with the high magnification view, we can actually see the long lines of the cytoskeleton that help to give the shape and structure. And remember these long lines of the uh, cytoskeleton are the neurofibrils. So remember, we still have myofibrils and muscle. Those muscle fibers will hear these fibers inside the, the neuron that give it a shape and structure are the neurofibrils. So there you go. Spinal cord smear, location, structure, function, and all the stuff that goes along with that. We did that. Ah, but yes, go ahead. Um, how, do you, how would you know the differences between dendrites and uh, the axon? Great year. question. Absolutely. So is it possible to be able to tell? Yes. Do I expect you to be able to do it? No. So notice for us for this exam, whether it's this thing or this thing or this thing or this thing or this thing, we are just going to use the generic term process, right? You think back to the bones, the things that stick off of the bones or the process. So this has multiple processes, but histologically, I'm not going to make you tell which one's the axon and which ones are the dendrites. So great question, but you're not responsible for it. So you just need to know the processes. Yes, if you're shown the spinal cord smear, assume they're anterior gray horn cells.
That is correct. Because in all likelihood, that's what they are. All right. Let's look at that other location we were talking about, that other location being the dorsal root ganglion. If we take a close up at the dorsal root ganglion, here we see the dorsal root coming in and we see all of the collection of cell bodies in here. But let's take a closer look. Notice when you take a closer look, there's a couple things that should stand out to you. For starters, we still see plenty of cells but how many processes do you see? None. None. Why not? These are the axons. They're not the axons, although that's a good guess. These are the cell bodies. But remember, we have a location. We're in the dorsal root ganglion. What is the structural classification of the neurons in the dorsal root ganglion? Unipolar. If you had a bucket full of apples and you threw them all up in the air and randomly sliced through them, what are the chances that you would cut the apple perfectly where you would be able to see the stem coming out of the apple as you cut it? Not many. Probably pretty unlikely. And that's exactly what's happening here. Every single one of these neurons only have one process that comes off of it, one axon that comes off of it. And the chances that we're going to slice it perfectly to be able to see that axon coming off are pretty darn slim. So the fact that we see no processes is a dead giveaway that we're in the dorsal root ganglia and we're looking at unipolar neurons. But there's a second dead giveaway as well. Remember, the dorsal root ganglion is in the peripheral nervous system. And in the peripheral nervous system, there are these cells that wrap around the circumference of the cell bodies of the neurons, helping to protect them, helping to establish uh, the uh, ion concentrations, metabolizing neurotransmitters, right? They go around the circumference of the cell, almost like they were in orbit around the cell. There you go. Notice here, we very clearly see those satellite cell neuroglial cells. So satellite cells are a second dead giveaway that we are in the dorsal root ganglion. So no process, satellite cells. But there's even a third dead giveaway. Again, notice for whatever reason, and I'm not sure why this is, the nucleus and the nucleoli tend to be much more clear in the dorsal root ganglion. Look how clearly you can see the nuclei and you can see the nucleolus, but that's somewhat subjective. But notice something else. Some of these cells are very dark in color, have a very dark pigmentation. And some of these are very light in color. So we have some that are darker in color and some that are lighter in color. A lot more variation in color in the cells because something very interesting happens in this dorsal root ganglion. As these cells are used, something interesting happens. They produce an undigestible fat. And that undigestible fat Oops. That undigestible fat just kind of accumulates in the cell. However, when we process the cell and we stain the cell, that undigestible fat soaks up more of the dye. And so it appears darker in color. It's been studied for many years and there aren't any studies that show that this affects function in any way. It's just this kind of weird thing that happens, kind of like how grandpa gets liver spots on him as he gets old. These cells get a little darker as they get old, as they get more used. Any idea what we might call this special undigestible fat found in these cells that give them this variation in color? Now, if only I was like Arthur and I had that handout in front of me and I could read off of the list. 
Come on, someone's got to have their list in front of you. What do you think you call the undigestible fat found inside of the the unipolar cells of the dorsal root ganglion? I'll wait. Is it um, endoneurium? Nope. Someone's got to have the histology list in front of them. Someone's got to have it in front of me, but okay. I'm just... so, uh, read off the things under dorsal root ganglion. Oh, dorsal root ganglia. Um, do I have the wrong list? There we go. Someone finally figured it out. Amanda's got it. Lipofusion. Right. Even has the term lipo, meaning lipid fat in it. So yeah, this variation in color that we see, remember it's the nissel bodies that give the multipolar neurons their name. It does. Um, but here that lipofusion is that undigestible fat that gives these dorsal root ganglion unipolar neurons their color. So once again, we have a location, function, structure, and the other anatomy we're responsible for that. So we've done unipolar, we've done multipolar. What does that leave us with? Bipolar, excellent. And of course, if we're gonna go look at bipolar neurons, we're going to of course go to the most beautiful and stunning and impressive and important organ of the human body. And that is the eyeball. Here we see our eye. Here is that iris that provides that uh, light, changing how much light comes in. Here's our lens, bending that light. And way back here in the back is the all important retina. Let's take a closer look at that retina. I'll be quiet for a moment so you can stare at awe at its magnificence and beauty. Excellent. Light enters into the eye from here on the right and comes through this way. And if you notice, let's not use blue since everything else in here is blue. There are basically three rows of cells that we see here in the retina. Well, four really important structures. Let's start easy. Notice this structure back here is a very dark pigmented structure known as the pigmented epithelium. We are diurnal organisms. What does that mean? Come on, we're doing the fun stuff now. No time to be brain frozen now. What does it mean to be diurnal? True, di that is one uh, definition of die, but diurnal is the opposite of nocturnal. So what does diurnal mean? We are awake during the day. Yeah, we are active during the day, absolutely. And during the day, there is more than enough light for us to be able to see and do what we need to do. Too much light, really. So we have this pigmented epithelium in the back so that as light comes into our eye, it absorbs some of it. You may not have thought of it in these terms, but I know you're aware of it because maybe you have a cat, which tend to be nocturnal, or maybe you've been driving your car where there's been a deer, which tend to be more active at, uh, at uh, dawn or at dusk when there isn't as much light available. And so in the back of their eyes, they actually have a reflective layer known as a tapetum. There you go. That's why your, your cat's eyes glow in the dark when the light hits them, because there's a reflective layer that amplifies the lights. And that's the problem with that deer. That deer walking across the street at night as your high beams hit it, it has that reflective layer in the back. And as that bright light of your headlight enters in there, it bounces around inside of their eyeball and it actually photo stuns them. So they become stunned, they stand right where they are, and you slam into them with your car. 
right? So again, we are diurnal. We have this pigmented area in the back. Then notice there are three layers of cells. Layer one of the cell, the ones that have the most cells, this layer here, is the layer that we refer to as, these are your photoreceptors. Your photoreceptors are what perceive the lights. Some of you may have heard of terms like rods and cones that allow us to see color and allow us to see things that dim light, things along those lines. Those are our photoreceptors and they're responsible for perceiving our light. Uh, out here, we have cells that are called the retinal ganglion cells. These are the ones whose axons make our optic nerve. Remember we said each eye has over a million axons in their optic nerves. Yes, I did my doctorate work on vision, but that's not, I am, yes, I am biased, but that doesn't make the eye any less important. It is still the most important organ of the body. Uh, over 60% of the information you get from the world around us is visual information. Over 40% of your nervous tissue is involved in processing visual information. So yes, I'm absolutely biased, but these informations are absolutely correct. But these are the ganglion cells. These are the ones that carry the information to your brain. So their axons come out and go and form, oh, let's not use that color, uh, come out and form our optic nerve, which carry that information into your eye. And that brings us this third layer here in the front. This third layer in the middle basically has a centrally located cell body. It has a single dendrite that allows it to receive information from the photoreceptors and then a single axon which carries that information to the ganglion cells. So based on the shape, based on the location, this middle row of cells here in the eye, guess which cells these are? The bipolar cells. Yeah, these are our bipolar neurons. Your eye, your retina of your eye is really an extension of your brain. When your optometrist looks in your eye to look at the health of your retina, they're looking at your brain. And here we have those neurons, those bipolar neurons, receiving information from the photoreceptors and sending it to the retinal ganglion cells. Now notice in this histology slide, the axons and the dendrites are small enough that we can't see them. We can only see the cell bodies. We can only see the nuclei, but that big, huge space in between helps us to see that organization. We know this third layer. When you see these three layers, you know you're looking in the retina of the eye and this middle layer is where we find our bipolar neurons. Our location is the retina of the eye. And of course, what is their function? Perceive light. Right, or again, the functional classification would be right, sensory and more specifically, specific sensory, special sensory, vision, absolutely. So there you go. Location, structure, function, multipolar, unipolar, a bipolar, somatic motor, autonomic motor, sensory. We've done all of these things and related all of them together. All right, I think that is it. Oh, there you go, cool look. Close up view of the central canal with some of those ependymal cells around the center. So cool. All right, so that is the last thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to go over some of that uh, to make sure again, we are comfortable with the histology you guys are responsible for. All right, questions on any of that? All right, excellent. One lecture left. We are almost done. So have a good day. Look at that sympathetic stuff uh, so that we can work on that and start continuing to go through that on Thursday. We'll finish that up and then we'll hopefully have some chance for some more sensory stuff at the end of that. All right, guys, have an excellent day. Uh, study hard, and I will see you Thursday for our last lecture. Bye. See ya.